People say that money makes the world go round. And it's true in the sense that it's a force in the world, but not as strong as gravity. And when money and economic matters are viewed from a Catholic perspective, it can be a force for good. We'll talk about that tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to uh, EWTN Live, where we take a look at guests from all over the world and talk to them about things that they have to say. And tonight we have a guest who is an assistant research professor at the Bush School of Business and Economics at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. He's the host of a brand new EWTN live show that's going to be on Friday nights at 10 p.m. called A Force for Good. And that takes a look at business and economic matters from a Catholic point of view. He's also the author of the book, Money, Greed, and God, Why Capitalism is the Solution and Not the Problem. So please welcome Dr. J. Richards. Dr. Richards, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Good to have you here. How long have you been a uh, professor over at uh, Catholic U? I'm actually in my fourth year, and yeah. the Bush School, which is the School of Business and Economics, is actually itself fairly young. I think we're in our fifth or our sixth year. So we used to be just part of the School of Arts and Sciences, and mm -hmm. now we have our own School of Business and e Economics. Why, why would, uh, you know, so folks understand, a university yeah. means it's a place with a number of different schools studying all sorts of uh, aspects of knowledge. Right. And oftentimes there's a medical school mm -hmm. or dental school, law school, et cetera. Why would there be a school of business and economics? Honestly, it's for a couple of different reasons. One, there's a huge demand right now. If you look at the types of degrees, the things that kids are studying when they go to college, I think something like 20% of our freshman class is actually doing a major in the School of Business and Economics. So in, it's, at some point, it just becomes unviable to be a part of a larger school. You really mm -hmm. need you know, your own faculty. It allows you to do things you couldn't do otherwise. But of mm -hmm. course, Catholic U has also, I think it's only one of three schools of philosophy in the entire United States. And so the school's really well known for theology and philosophy, but we hope also with our particular take on economics and, and business theory that it will, before too long, also be known for its work in business and economics. Yeah, you know, so folks understand Catholic University has a school of theology. That's right. It has another distinct school of philosophy, mm -hmm. and that's partly because it's also uh, a, a pontifical university, and it gives uh, degrees that are called pontifical degrees. It's church-granted. That's right. It's the only pontifical university in the U.S., and so right. it essentially means there's the professors in theology and philosophy get official approval from the Vatican. Yeah, and then your school is a distinct school. Now, That's right. we want to make a little bit of a correction mm -hmm. uh, right away because A Force for Good is a series that will be taped at our Washington studios. That's exactly right. Yeah, so you're not going to be on live at 10 o'clock. Not live. They we can't ask you <laughs> questions on the air. <laughs> not at the moment, at least. Not like they can on, on the, these They shows. can't. So it's not live. It's actually, yeah, that's right. So uh, okay. 10 p.m. Eastern. So the, the middle part of every episode is. So you can be is, home with your kids. Absolutely. <laughs> Probably not watching it because I'll be, I'll, I've seen it several times. But it's really, I mean, we start out, the, the first segment of the show is actually an, an out of studio uh, segment. It's really a news magazine story about an uh, entrepreneur, a business person, or a business. Then the middle part is me in studio interviewing guests. And the final part is actually a, 
uh, a video editorial. So there's two of the three things are done in the studios at EWTN in DC. And a video editorial, which means? I, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like uh, Dennis Prager's Prager University. So it's essentially an editorial that uh, includes what's called kinetic typography. So lots of people- What does see, that mean? You see this, if you yeah. look at your news feed on Facebook, you'll, yeah. you'll see a lot of these. And essentially what they are is they're a red editorial in which you have somebody speaking, but it's animated with both text and illustrations uh, in the visual screen. So it's, it's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a really kind of a new way. It's only a three or four, maybe five year old way of doing this in which the, the person is taped in front of a green screen and then animation is overlaid after the fact. And it, it's, it's catchy, it, uh, it's easier and easier to, to follow and to remember than say just a red editorial or simply someone just speaking. Uh, see, this is why they have young professors, because you know that that exists, and furthermore, you know how to do it. We old people, we, we'll, we'll watch. <laughs> well, the middle part is the traditional sort of interviews, and there's, of course, a lot of great people to talk to about this yes. subject in Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's one of the issues then. Um, a lot of people, uh, we, we have a, a lot of divisions mm. in our, our culture yes. that, um, you know, the subtitle of your book says that uh, capitalism is the solution and not the problem. But we have a lot of people who think that capitalism is the problem. But, yeah, and that's right. That's, that's a big dispute. Uh, and then the role of government mm -hmm. in controlling the economy or not. Uh, we had a socialist candidate right. running for president uh, in you know uh, last year. Mm -hmm. So you know uh, because a lot of popularity because people are not convinced That's right. that capitalism is the way. How do we? How do you come to this? point of view? Well, I came to this point of view, it was actually a long time coming, to tell you the truth. I was raised, I'm, my family and I are actually converts to the Catholic faith. I was raised Presbyterian, basically an mm -hmm. evangelical, got off to a, a small uh, liberal arts, I would say a formerly Christian liberal arts school probably. Uh, my freshman year, I read the Communist Manifesto for my introductory political science mm -hmm. course. Actually, by Christmas, I thought of myself as a Christian socialist and spent several years thinking that way, but kept reading around the subject. I was sort of transfixed by this issue. I thought, okay, Jesus talks a lot about the poor. The socialists talk a lot about the poor. Does that mean we should be socialists? That was kind of my thinking initially. But sure. the, the more sure. I studied economics and compared different countries, honestly. I mean, if you think of the 20th century, it's like a, it was a, like a vast experiment with these different ways of ordering society. And mm -hmm. so we figured out really well, well, socialism, it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It's not what is advertised. To Why? Do. Why well, is it that it, it doesn't accomplish its goal? Because its goal yeah. is very, I, I mean, Marx's goal economically was rather noble. Mm -hmm. He wanted everybody to have right. an equal share and that nobody would have too much and nobody would have too little. That was uh, his economic goal, the rest of his Yes, goals. that's right. That's, that was sort of the promise. Uh, and in fact, in Marxist theory, the socialist stage in which the government owns everything and abolishes private property, that was supposed to be, in Marxist theory, a temporary stage. And he said, after the new socialist man emerged, then he claimed the state would wither away and people would live in this sort of stateless utopia. Just that all the times it was actually tried, they got stuck in that socialist stage. I'd say there's a lot of stuff wrong with it. There's a lot of reasons it didn't go well. I would say the main reason is that it fundamentally misunderstood the human person and misunderstood how important private property and private property laws are for just basic human flourishing. And, and also the dignity of the individual person right. rather than the state or the economy. Exactly. Do you know the Russian definition of capitalism and communism? No. Capitalism is man oppressing man. Communism is just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, and the reality is, and it the, became, I mean, yeah. it became far more oppressive than what you oh, see it, in the democratic capitalist West. Unimaginable. I mean, we know at a lower bound, about a hundred million people were killed by their governments in communist countries in the 20th yeah. century. I'm not, I'm not talking about Hitler. I'm talking about right, no, people Hitler, that, yeah, it's a different story. Hitler was an amateur. Yeah, yeah, he, exactly. Hitler was responsible for the execution of 10 million people, mm -hmm. as evil as he was. 
That's right. But Stalin is 61.9 million, and Mao Zedong is about 90 million. We know that Mao, in terms of the number of people killed in a short period of time, about five years during the Cultural Revolution, yes. he's at the top of that ghoulish list of yep. mass murderers. Yep. All these guys claim to be following Marx's philosophy. And so I very quickly realized as I studied that, okay, socialism doesn't work. What about capitalism? And I think part of the problem is honestly the word. The word capitalism was coined by socialists. Marx, more than anyone, made that word popular. And his idea was that, well, it's a system in which capital, in which wealth controls people. Well, of course, it's, that's what it means. No one endorses that. And so the first thing you have to do when you're talking about these issues is get the definitions of words down. I mean, did, did, um, Joe, uh, did Adam Smith ever uh, define what he's doing as capitalism? Never used the word. Did he, he never, never that? No, nowhere, ex absolutely not. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, Adam exactly. Smith, in his famous 1776 book, The Wealth of Nations, talks about what he calls the natural system of liberty, which didn't mean anarchy. What he was talking about was essentially private property, human rights, limited government, and people being able to exchange in freely. In a free market. Exactly, that's yeah. what he meant. And he called it the natural system of liberty. He knew, he knew nothing of the word capitalism. The American founders knew nothing of the word. It's just, it's weird, it's sort of like. It's, no, it's not weird. Think about how pro-abortion people turn mm. it to pro-choice. Yes. And, you know, uh, and all, all you grab hold of the vocabulary, that's and right. then you control the discussion. That's exactly right. And the left and is that's very what Marx good. did. Yeah, Marx he did. invented capitalism to get hold of the discussion. That's right. And take it over. Well, and I, it, with, when I'm talking to college students about this, I always ask them, "Okay, I'm going to use this word capitalism, and I want you to tell me what picture is in your mind." And over and over again. The picture in people's minds, as in my mind, is Uncle Pennybags. He's the little character from the Monopoly game. This is the picture, you know, he's tuxedo clad right, guy right, with right, the, right, right. the monocle and, and you know, the, uh, the cigar. Uh, that's, the, that's the image. But what we're talking about is what I would, I would prefer to call economic freedom or free enterprise. Private property, limited government, human rights, uh, respect for families and for civil society and things that are not part in, of the government and, free and economic freedom exactly yeah, yeah. in free market that's and so when i use the word that's the meaning i use and if you know john paul in his encyclical tentesimus honest in 1991 has this passage where he says well if by capitalism you mean this then no if if we mean greed and rapaciousness and you know exploiting our fellow human beings no if we mean by it private property economic freedom, then yes. But maybe we should call it something like the business economy or something. And it's essentially thought the word's too tainted to try to, to resurrect it. And my feeling is who cares about the word we use? Let's talk about the kinds of systems that allow people to flourish, that allow cultures to emerge from absolute poverty. That's the key question for economics. One of the people that you interviewed has a franchise for McDonald's. Mm, many over, franchises. Yeah, ma oh, many yes, franchises. Many franchises. Oh, okay. uh, over in uh, California and yes. such. Yeah. You have a clip that you, when you interviewed him, do you mind if we take a look at that? No, that'd be great. Yeah, let's do that. There's so many companies now that see how blending the principles of business and blending the principles of the common good together for the good of the entire culture. You know, if I believe my my job is my vocation. It's my opportunity to do the best I can, not only for myself, but for the culture in general and for the common good. Then business opens up an incredible amount of opportunity for you. And you know, this is something that's very important about you know uh, business. There's mm. there are lots of ways to make a living. Yes. Um, you know. Up until the late 19th century, the majority of Americans were farmers. Absolutely. And in fact, at the revolution, it was 90% were yeah. farmers, and today we're less than 1%. That's right, exactly. And even 100 years ago, even in 1900, half the country were still living on and working on farms. So imagine in 230 years, this radical shift from an agrarian lifestyle to feeding ourselves uh, with less than 1% of the population working on farms. Feeding ourselves and, and others. a large part of the rest of the that's world. That's right. But that was something where most farmers had their own land, mm -hmm. and now 
that you know that that's changed a lot. We have an urban society mm -hmm. as the result of the industrial revolution, right? And that um, uh, we, we live in a different circumstance where people can make money working for somebody else, mm -hmm. or they can start their own business. What what should be the uh, attitude of Catholics in regard to having this free enterprise and uh, our place in this present economy, which itself is again changing with of course. the computer and Absolutely. this focus on business rather than production. Absolutely, because I mean the reality is that the primary resource insofar as you might have thought of land as a resource at one point, uh, the primary resource now is really the human mind. That's the, the key resource. So that's the way in which most wealth is created now in a high-tech world. We've moved just, just in American history from an essentially an agrarian society to a manufacturing and an industrial society mm -hmm. to essentially kind of a service-based and information society in which it's actually possible for us to work at home on our computers and communicate with people all around the country and all around the world. Mm -hmm. And it creates amazing opportunities, but it also, of course, uh, presents significant new challenges. And uh, But they're different kinds of challenges. Most of us, at least in the United States, we don't spend time worrying about starving to death. We don't worry about the government, mm -hmm. for the most part, right, arresting us and locking us up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the kinds of things that most people for most of history actually worried about. We have a new sort of set of problems and a new set of opportunities. And mm -hmm. so, honestly, what I feel my mission is, is to help Catholics understand, okay, what's, what's economic reality like? What have we learned from history about what works and doesn't work? And what does Catholic social teaching have to say about this? Because I think there's positive contributions that Catholic theology uh, and ethics and social teaching actually have for economics itself and for business itself. I noticed a pattern. I, I did a study uh, a couple years ago um, on uh, the papal teaching on slavery mm. and showing how from 1435 forward. Yes. It had been put under automatic excommunication. It was condemned mm -hmm. you, uh, and, you know, over and on. People didn't yeah, listen. They didn't. The papal bulls that right, announced right, it. Right, yeah. Right. But what was, the reason I bring that up is the last of those encyclicals was by Pope Leo XIII. Mm. And it was enough to convince the last Christian country with slaves, namely the Empire of Brazil, yes. to set their slaves free. And he asked for it as a gift for his 50th anniversary of his ordination. Mm. So they did. But at that point that he finished the teaching on slavery, he then began labor and yes. uh, how to deal with uh, the, this new economy. Uh, the, the, and that's when the so-called social teaching began. It really didn't begin No, then. that's right. It had gone, been going it on. Had. But it had this new phase of the social teaching on labor, rerum novarum, exactly. uh, began a new phase. How has the church kept up in this regard as, uh, as far as ethics goes? Well, well there, there is this convention that you alluded to of starting so-called Catholic social teaching with rerum novarum in 1891. But of course, uh, the church's resources, both in scripture and the church fathers and, and papal bulls and encyclicals going all the way back are relevant. The reason I think people tend to start with rerum novarum is it's the first encyclical that deals specifically with the kind of the economic question about labor and capital, the workers, the owners, and those kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, it's the first to deal with the Industrial Revolution. That's right. Economy. That's right. And so the the difficulty has been that that was you know 1891. Centesimus Honest was written in 1991, the hundredth year of that. So we're talking about just a little more than a century that this discussion has been taking place, and yet uh, look what's changed. I mean, still in in 1891, still in Europe. Industrialization was happening, but there were about half the population were still in the country, and we're now but past by country, that. But you mean in the the, the agricultural exactly realm. Yes. in the agricultural realm exactly. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we're really uh, in the developed world, at least uh, Europe and Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Japan, countries like that. 
we're well past that industrial stage uh, in which very few people, for instance, even it doesn't even occur to them that, well, owning a farm would be the way that they would invest their money. So if somebody wanted to do that, they could, but most people will think, well, I might invest in stocks or I'll buy a home in a city or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's just a completely different way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And I think this is my own opinion uh, that John Paul's encyclical, Centesimus Honest, is in many ways the encyclical for the 21st century economic questions because mm -hmm. it's the encyclical that most clearly dealt with the role of ingenuity and human creativity in the production of wealth, which mm -hmm. I think is the key ingredient in the information economy. Even though, I mean, he wrote it in 1991. This was pre-Google. It was pre a lot of the things that we're talking about now. But he had, I think, the foresight. I think it will, will someday be seen as a prophetic document in the sort of economic insights that he has in mm -hmm. that document and I think are still there uh, for the tapping and for the plumbing. One of the things that St. John Paul did every year was meet with scientists, mm. technology experts yes. and others. Uh, to, and whether they were believers or not, right. he wanted to understand what was on its way. And I think that in, informed him. This is something that all of us Catholics have to have a sense of understanding where is the economy going? Mm -hmm. Most of us don't know much about farming. <laughs> You know, That's right. A few do, yes, and and, and I I know some about a little bit about mm -hmm. what goes on in farming and such. Uh, hang around lots of farms, and did some farm work myself, but it's. That's not where most people are. It's not, and if you, you know, look that's why. In, in I don't know if you saw the survey in London. They did a survey. They thought that breakfast cereal grew on trees. There's a Cheerios <laughs> tree, a shredded wheat tree, and so forth. the Fruit Loop tree is especially yeah. popular. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not surprised. Yeah. But, you know, what's funny though is that if you actually look even now at what people are doing on farms, the vast majority of of tractors and combines used in the United States use a technology called auto steer. They essentially are autonomous vehicles. The farmer is usually around, but it's actually a really, really high-tech enterprise for the yeah, most part. Right, and some people right. are wanting to return to the land to do things in a sort of natural and organic way, and they're free to do that. But the reality is they're not doing it out of necessity. They're doing it for preference. I say it's sort of fancy gardening rather than the kind of farming that most people engaged in for the last 200 it, years. It serves well to take a look at photographs of farmers 50, 60s, 100 years ago and how thin they are. Oh yeah. And then modern farmers. <laughs> well, I mean my, not my, quite as thin. My mom and her and my my mom in Texas, the panel of Texas, she and her five siblings, she tells these stories growing up having to pick cotton on her uh, sure. uncle uh, uncle Crowder's farm. It wasn't a it, you know, this she wasn't saying, gosh, I wish I could get back to that. In fact, all she and all of her siblings went to college. No one returned to cotton farming because they had other choices. Right, and that's, the, that's one of my points. We don't know about that, but we do need to know. Uh, you may not ever study about how to grow cotton, yeah. but you need to know a lot more about the present economy and Absolutely. where it's going and how we think about economic issues morally. Absolutely. That's where, and that's what I like what you're doing. You're yeah. trying to bring good knowledge of the economy into moral thought rather than, as some people say in other networks, mm -hmm. your feelings about yes. morals. Exactly. It's not your feelings. It's not your feelings. It's thinking. Well, and both of these are. I mean, this is the irony, as I often say, the two subjects in which people feel like they can have perfectly settled opinions and know nothing about the subject is theology in economics, and part of that is because they don't realize, well, but there's knowledge to be had in theology, and there's actually knowledge to be had in economics. We know some things about how economies work. We know what prices do. This is why we study the subject, but often, I, yeah, I hate to say many faithful fellow Catholics just sort of think, well, I can sort of figure out economics just based on my my moral intuitions or something like that. But that, that's not gonna help you understand well, what happens when prices are controlled. The, those are economic questions that you, you need to go out and learn so that when you, when you connect them with your moral convictions, you actually support policies that help people rather than hurt them. Yeah, it's um, a very important component to see that uh, your life is not 
compartmentalized. Mm. In other words, do you have the religion compartment, your family compartment, your business compartment, yes. your politics, impart and they don't integrate. Your religion, your faith, is meant to integrate all of these mm. elements in God our Lord. Absolutely. That's, that's the goal. That is the goal. Now, uh, I'd like to take a look at another clip from yeah. your series. Yeah, you interviewed the gentleman who started Francia. Art Silka. Yeah, is it Francia? Is that Francia, it? yeah. Yeah, Francia, yeah. Uh, uh, wine in a box. That's right. Um, what happened to barrels, <laughs> bottles? <laughs> Let's take a look at what he talks about in terms of his keys to business. I think there are four keys to running a successful business. One is having a clear-cut vision of what it is you want to do. Secondly is having the right strategy. Thirdly, and very importantly, is hiring the right people. And by that I mean people who are not only talented but have the right values. And then the final and most important job is to create a culture of excellence. The wine company did not just introduce a new way to store and transport wine in the American market. It established a culture of excellence that shaped the most mundane elements of its day-to-day -day operations. Our cultural values were the overriding reason for our success. Developing and instilling cultural values was the most important part of my job, and I spent a lot of time doing it. For me, principled entrepreneurship is creating long-term real sustainable value for society. Starting with the consumers who bought our wines, followed by our employees and our customers, the middlemen through whom we sold our products. And then lastly, stockholders. And we never put stockholders first. We never made short-term decisions unless they were building for the long-term. Unfortunately, a lot of people today are content to succeed without any, any value. Instead of creating wealth, they redistribute it to themselves. And that's not a win-win situation, that's a win-lose situation. And uh, society suffers when that happens, especially the poor. Well, it sounds like he really has an excellent sense of how to do business. Mm that creating a culture that yes. is built on ethics, not sort of attached on the that's side. That's right. And that's, unfortunately, there's this thing called corporate social responsibility that's really popular these days. But very often what it is, is it's kind of a marketing gimmick in which companies do things that they know the culture likes and so that they assume that they're ethical. It's different to actually create an ethical culture. Art Sioka, himself a faithful Catholic, understood this from the beginning. And that's something that both I personally try to get across to people, but also that we try to get across to people at the Bush School of Business and Economics, is that it's not like, well, okay, ethics is gonna go kind of on top of your business and it'll be a little accoutrement, but rather it'll actually make you a better business person, a better employee, a better employer, actually be successful, more successful in your business than if you tried to cut corners. That's, I think, the, the myth that we want people to get over. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, in fact, in a lot of places, uh, I had a discussion uh, earlier today about how, well, you just take it for granted that politicians are gonna be corrupt. We should never take no. that for granted, A, they are not all corrupt. No, that's that's right. not true. That's right. And some of them are very fine folks. Mm -hmm. But also, if we take it for granted that they are corrupt, then we'll let them take our money. <laughs> that's exactly that's what right. That's they're doing. No, that's when exactly they're corrupt. Right. Yeah. And and the poor especially suffer. They do from corrupt politicians. But that's also the case with business people. Yes. That, that we should not assume that it's okay to be corrupt in business. Absolutely, and in fact, I mean, being corrupt, as long as the, the, you have rule of law, of course, so that you're not allowed to steal from each other and defraud uh, each other, so that's in place. 
it's not a good business plan long term to figure out how to rip off your customers. It might might work for a little bit, but you know, this famous quote from Adam Smith. He said, you know, we do not expect our the butcher, the brewer, and the baker. We don't expect our dinner uh, because of their benevolence, but from their regard to their own interest. He wasn't saying the butcher, the brewer, and the baker are selfish. What he was saying is that when you have private property rights and the rule of law, the best way the butcher can succeed as a butcher is to provide things for his customers that they'll freely buy. So in other words, right. a business person, when you have the rule of law, the best way to succeed long term is to provide things for other people. So mm -hmm. it's really, in a, in, in a way, enterprise and entrepreneurship in the right kind of economic system, it's other directed, it's altruistic in the mm -hmm. sense that, look, you're not gonna succeed long term unless you figure out how to meet the needs of others and to do it better than your competitors. See, that's one of the very important ethical concerns. Mm. When I choose to make a product, how is that going to benefit society? That's, you know, what is the good that, do I make a product because I can get away with something that mm. is silly? Mm -hmm. Or do I make a product that really benefits folks and long term? You know, I, I saw this with my father who sold used cars wow. in Chicago mm -hmm. on the Northwest side. And he always made sure that he told the customers, this is a problem with the car, mm. but the rear end, trans, and engine are good, but right. the body has this problem, and this is the price. Because he told them that, customers came Absolutely. back. Absolutely, that's exactly right. Customers yeah. came back, and then it was word of mouth. Now, exactly. in many ways, it doesn't even have to re rely on word of mouth. If you try to rip somebody off and you're a used car salesman, trust me, Carfax and Yelp and all sorts of online forums will suddenly tag you uh, as a ripoff artist. That's, yeah. that's the thing is, um, especially in information economy, your reputation uh, can stand or fall just with one articulate customer that you ripped off may, you know, yeah. spread it to the world what you've done online. Yeah, and I can usually contrast it to my dad's close friend. Mm. He was very close to him and never did business with him <laughs> because he was not honest and he always had to carry a pistol. Because they were after him. Wow. We have to take a little bit of a break. Uh, if you want more information on Catholic University of America and Bush School of Business and Ethics, go to business.cua.edu. So business.cua.edu, and you find out a lot more about this and see that. If you want your children to get an education where they're also going to learn how to think about right and wrong that you started teaching them uh, uh, growing up, this is a place to go do so. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so please stay with us. Now, you can get this book called A Catechism for Business, Tough Ethical Questions and Insights from Catholic Teaching. It is by Andrew Abella and Joseph Capizzi. You can get that at EWTNRC.com, EWTNRC.com, or you can call 
1-800-633-6316. And when you're there, you can also get Dr. Richard's book, Money, Greed, and God, Why Capitalism is the Solution and Not the Problem. Yeah. You know, this issue of capitalism, mm. uh, again, it, it, it's a... I, I'm, I don't like using yeah. Marx's word because Marx was not only mean, uh, uh, he's a nasty <laughs> he man, was. but um, or if you want to find out how nasty he was, look into his family life. Oh, it's a disaster. It's a, oh, he was awful. But uh, apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the, the, we, I don't like to use his vocabulary on capitalism, right. but free market uh, much better. Uh, is, is much better for market enterprise, uh, or uh, economy. And this was not really invented by Adam no. Smith, and his was not the first book. No, not at all. Back in the 17th century, mm. a number of priests were writing about that. Absolutely. Tell us about these scholastics. Yeah, this is a little known fact. I mean, Adam Smith is a Scottish moral philosopher, probably a deist, and so you could think of him as part of the Scottish Enlightenment. And a lot of people think that the basic ideas of a free economy uh, it sort of started with him. So they're the product of the Enlightenment. Right. The reality is that Smith himself was reading, especially Spanish scholastics who developed the function of price, what is economic value, uh, the effect of prices on an economy and controlling prices, kind of all the things that you end up learning in a mi microeconomics class in college actually had their origins well before Adam Smith and in, in, in the, as early as the high middle ages. And so many of these ideas, I think what Smith did is he, first of all, he translated that work for an English speaking and an English reading audience. Yeah, these, the, so the folks understand that these scholastics uh, would write uh, in Latin. That's right. Because that was the international it language. Was. It was the lingua franca, to, you know. To, Before uh, yeah, French exactly. was Exactly, it was franca. Latin. And so, uh, of course, educated people in the 1700s knew this, and Smith knew this, and so he had precursors. So this idea that he sort of invented economics is very much a misnomer. It's sort of popular in the English-speaking world. Yeah, he, he made it, he put it into English. Yes, he did. And had great impact on Absolutely. people like Thomas Jefferson, who was very strongly influenced by the Scottish Enlightenment. Absolutely, and I mean, the reality is people like John Witherspoon, for instance, who yes. was a you know, very conservative, what we'd now call an evangelical Christian, studied Thomas Reed, who was a, a, a Protestant Christian philosopher that was part of the Scottish Enlightenment. So in many ways, the Scottish Enlightenment was more moderate and, and I think more religion friendly uh, than the, the French Enlightenment and the yes. things that came out of the French Revolution. And so in many ways, we're sort of beneficiaries of that. But people shouldn't think that all these ideas were just sort of invented from whole cloth there in 1776 when Adam Smith wrote his book, The Wealth of Nations. And nor should they think that we haven't discovered things since then. I mean, many of the kind of key insights that people study when they, they do economics now, uh, they're discoveries of the 20th century. Different things get discovered at different times, and I think we should count ourselves blessed that many of the things that were sort of open questions a thousand or even 500 years ago, we now have pretty good answers to, if only because we have more historical experience you know, with what works. Yeah, you know, give me an example of that. Absolutely, I mean, simple things like controlling prices. It was really popular for a long time that essentially the key dictated how much something was supposed to cost. And so it would just sort of specify how much a gallon of wine was going to cost or something like that. That, that makes sense to people because you think, okay, the king will, will keep the price down where lower income people can afford it. That's usually what people have in mind when they talk about controlling prices in a modern economy. Well, all economists know that if you control or force prices below whatever the, the market price is, you create massive shortages. So you might want to tr be preserving some product, whether it's a gallon of gasoline or a gallon of water, but there's going to be a natural market price, which essentially represents the underlying supply and demand of that thing. So, you know, the gas station on the corner can't just arbitrarily charge any old price that he wants. In fact, he's got competitors, there are costs that he's going to have, and so it's going to more or less in a competitive environment approximate the underlying supply and demand. And so you want an economic system really to be able to give you accurate signals about those things. Price controls scramble economic signals and they actually end up 
hurting people rather than helping people. We know that now, and we did, didn't really understand that two or three hundred years ago. I, I uh, know that uh, in, uh, as an example of pricing control, sometimes through taxation mm -hmm. and such, um, when uh, the people in the, especially the federal government and some of the state governments were very favorable at one time to tobacco growing. Yes. Cigarettes were extremely cheap. Mm -hmm. It was two dollars for a carton. <laughs> and then as they, um, I, I think the turning point for the government was when uh, uh, Medicare started. Yes. The average smoker lives to be 69. Mm. Medicare starts at 65. Mm -hmm. So Medicare had to pay for the cancer, uh, uh, you know, uh, treatments. treatments. Yeah. And so then they said, oh, this is terrible. And then they turned against and they raised the prices right. so that it becomes less economically right. viable. That's right. It's to, just less to demand. smoke. And the, and the government knows that perfectly well when it comes to things like cigarettes. They know that, okay, if we tax this thing, we're going to discourage it. But they forget it when it comes to things like economic activity. <coughs> if you mm -hmm. tax people's productive activity, too highly, you're also going to discourage that. And so the same politician may understand this economic lesson in one area and then ignore it or deny it in another. Yeah, this is um, uh, something that people have to pay close attention to. Uh, when politicians are talking about their taxes, they, they have a number of issues. Mm -hmm. What are they spending? How much are they spending? What, uh, you know, why do they want to spend? And where do they think they're going to get our money from? <laughs> you know? No, that's right. I mean, tax money, it's not, the government has to get the money from someplace. So you yeah. either get it from the population that lives now or you get it from the future population in the form of borrowing. Those are the only two places that the government can get money from. Yeah. And so it's either going to be borrowed or it's going to be extracted from the economy. Now, the government has... God-given responsibilities and duties and things it's supposed to do. Yes. Uh, and so we want it to be properly funded for that. But sure. I, I, my own opinion is that the federal government in particular is now involved in so many things that it not only should not be doing, but is actually really bad at doing. And, and so this is the difficulty is that government gets involved in so many things that are outside its core competence that yeah. it ends up being less competent in the things it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, and, and this is something where um, we have to then be careful because sometimes as a tool or a rhetorical device mm. um, to uh, get more taxation, you know, business people will be demonized. Right. Uh, they're greedy. Yeah. They shouldn't have that much. They shouldn't make that much and so on. Um, as if a, they have a moral norm that they know how much you, sh you should make. <laughs> That's always the difficult question. Everyone seems to think that everyone that makes more than them makes too much, yeah. right? <laughs> and it's always, but that person always, it's never me, it's always the guy that just makes a little more than I do. But this is, I mean, the reality is this is always a great danger for a society. If you get a large segment of the population to say, I'm gonna elect politicians that will extract wealth from someone else and give it to me. Uh, that's the that's a sign of real trouble. We've never had that uh, entirely in the in, uh, American politics, fortunately, like they're suffering from, say, in Venezuela right now, in right. which things really do go to seed. But that's a dangerous tendency that I think we always have to yeah, check. I, th I, I heard that if you took all the money of every billionaire in the country mm -hmm. and confiscated everything yeah. they own, you could run the federal government for somewhere between uh, eight to ten days. I mean, it's not going to be much. People no. imagine that there's a group of yeah. rich guys that are holding all this money, but as you said, you could tax them all uh, at a hundred percent. You'd get all their money the first year. You wouldn't get any of their productive activity the year after that, though. That's that's right. Well, cost. see, that's why I always <laughs> compare this to killing the goose yes. that lays the golden eggs. Exactly. So you can get all the eggs at once. Well, and Never we all know idea. this. I mean, we know this that the late Steve Jobs. He didn't get wealthy stealing iPhones from homeless people. We know this, right? That's, that's not how wealth and value are created in an economy, but we, we, we forget it in other contexts. We just assume, well, if that guy has gotten wealthy, he must have gotten wealthy at someone else's expense. If Peter's rich, he must have stolen from Paul. That's one of the most insidious myths, that the only way to get wealthy in an economy is to extract wealth. This is one of the things that you, edit, uh, you address in one of your... Um 
kinetic uh, editorial thing, or kinetic typo. I don't even kinetic know typography. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. See, I, I don't know that stuff. Never did that. But um, I'd like to take a look at one sure. so I can find out what the heck you really okay. are talking about. Let's take a look at that, uh, one that deals with this issue. We've all heard it a thousand times. Business is all about money and greed. Just think of almost any business person you see in the movies. There's almost always a greedy character. There's Ebenezer Scrooge in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. There's that money-grubbing Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life. There's even that iconic tuxedo-clad banker from the game of Monopoly. His name, by the way, is Uncle Pennybags. As Christians, we know that greed's not good. On the contrary, it's one of the seven deadly sins. Why is it deadly? It's deadly because it leads, in the end, to idolatry. When we're greedy, our possessions, our material wealth, take the place of God. But there's only one true God. That's why Jesus told his disciples that no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. If business really were all about miserliness and serving money, that would be a big problem. It would mean that faithful Catholics could only enter business by endangering their souls. But is it true? The question isn't whether there are greedy people in business. Of course there are. You can find greedy people in every profession. Greedy doctors, greedy professors, maybe even greedy priests. It's easy to think of some selfish business person or company that bilks retired widows out of their life savings. But we often hear about them when they're going bankrupt or being charged with a crime. It doesn't sound like a great business plan. Here's a better question. Is greed good for business? That is, do you need to be selfish to succeed in business? The answer to that is an obvious no. Think about the real businesses you encounter every day your grocery store, your barber, your dentist, your favorite restaurant or clothing store. You have a choice where you buy your meat, your vegetables, your socks, and your t-shirts. So why do you do business with them? It's because they provide you with something you want, and you want it enough to pay for it at the offered price. Your local grocer can't make you buy his bananas. He has to go out of his way to appeal to you. The late management guru, Peter Drucker, said that the purpose of business is to create and keep a customer. In a market economy, you can't succeed in business long term without customers. It's hard to get and to keep customers if they think you're selfish and trying to rip them off. In other words, the best way to succeed in business isn't to fall prey to greed. It's not to exploit your neighbors, but to serve them. That sounds a lot like the second greatest commandment, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's not just good for the soul. It's good for business. Well, now I get it. <laughs> that's what so I was that's talking about. that's what you're doing. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, it does work. I like it. It does, but you can't really do it live. That's the one thing. Oh, you know, you have yeah. to record it ahead of time. Okay. <laughs> I have to do one of those one of these days. Learn how, learn how anyway. Sure. Um, but it, you bring out a great point, you yeah. know, that... Uh, if you go into business with greed and selfishness, you may make some money sure. for a little while, mm -hmm. but eventually that's going to unravel. Yeah, it's a terrible business plan. I mean, uh, the, there's a stereotypical miser, but who is the miser? The miser is the guy who makes a bunch of money, has a bunch of gold, and then he stores it in his mattress or in a hole in the ground. But if you think about what entrepreneurs do in market economies, it's quite the opposite. They, they put their wealth at risk. I've interviewed entrepreneurs for the show that uh, had their last $5,000 that they, they put up in order to pursue a dream that they thought, now, I might be able to create a service that will uh, meet the needs of hundreds of thousands of people, or I might go broke. That's exactly the opposite of the miser who's hoarding his wealth, right? It's actually putting your wealth at risk in pursuit of some vision to serve others mm -hmm. in some way, and maybe even anticipate needs that people have that they don't know they have. That's, that's the normal way that it works in enterprise. It's not this kind of greedy miser character. That's just not a good business plan. Yeah, no, it's, uh, one, another side of that is, if I need a job, 
which I don't, mm -hmm. because I don't care what happens to the economy. <laughs> I never run out of sinners. And the ignorant are born every day. So it's recession-proof. Yeah. Yeah, recession-proof. But if I did need a job, I wouldn't go to a, a city street corner where there's a guy with a Windex and a squeegee yeah. and ask him for a job. No, of course not. He chased me off his corner. <laughs> That's right. I need to go to someone who has a, enough capacity to hire others. That's exactly right. That takes, uh, that's where capital does come in. You have to have things to be able to Absolutely. hire other people. Some wealth had to be created. And of course, we all have to eat and drink, so some has to be consumed. But you never have a, a, a sustainable business unless some of that capital has been reinvested, both in equipment, but also in workers. And so that's why in high tech countries, our labor is worth more than it would be in low tech countries. And so, you know, my I lived years in Seattle, for instance, and even 14-year-old babysitters got $12 an hour. <laughs> that's, that's Seattle. $12 but that, dollars yes, an hour? You would, couldn't find a babysitter unless you were willing to pay him or her $12 an hour because that's, that, that's what the market sort of bears in that place. That wouldn't yeah. make any sense in many places, but that's, right. that's the, the kind of reality. What we want out of an economy, it's not going to save us. Of course, money is not the answer to all of our problems, but God made us as bodily creatures. They have needs. We need shelter. We need food. We need water. We need medicine. And so what we want is for as much of that to be available to as many people as possible, especially the people on the bottom rung of the economic ladder. To me, that's the, the key moral question for economics. How does this economic system allow or disallow people that are at the bottom to be able to work themselves out of poverty through their own work and ingenuity? And you know, this, uh, especially, I've been working with a number of uh, ministers mm. here in this city because our concern is for the, the poor who don't have job opportunities. Mm. And the idea of them being able to go to college may not be the best no, way to do not. that. That there are other kinds of work yes. that other folks can provide that capital and the incentive with uh, uh, wages yes. as well. You know, for instance, in the poor neighborhoods, if there were more trained electricians, carpenters, Absolutely. plumbers, all these different yes. tasks, those neighborhoods could be kept up because they'd be working at it and they'd have the skills exactly to right. maintain them. I'm glad you raised that because now I'm a professor at Catholic University. I'm interested in having students come and get bachelor's degrees, and that makes sense for some students. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm quite confident that if the choice is to become an, an apprentice, to become an electrician, or go to a college and get a gender studies degree, I would say go, go with the electrician option. You're going to create value for yourself, Absolutely. for your family, and for Absolutely. others. And there are many, th this idea that there's not dignity in that kind of work is a terrible myth that we need to fight because learning complex actions that you have to do with your body, that's a type of knowledge, it's a type of skill. And there are as many entrepreneurs in what we would think of as the blue collar sector as there are in the white collar sector. And in fact, there's a lot, of, lot more opportunities at the moment. I'm constantly hearing about uh, sort of underemployment, the fact that you can't get enough people working in these skilled trade areas. Yeah, you know, I'm the son of uh, blue collar folks. Um, my dad was a mechanic, he mm -hmm. learned it during World War II in Africa, and he became a great mechanic and, you know, did start business. Some of his businesses failed, yeah. and some of them finally succeeded. But there were those options and opportunities, and when he did succeed, he hired more people. Absolutely. This I mean, is, uh, you know, this was something that was a very important thing. I was able to go to university and get the degrees I got, um, but, you know, I know I stand on the shoulders yes. of my working class and Absolutely. agricultural relatives. Yeah, I mean, uh, even being able to go to college is itself, it's really a luxury good. We imagine, absolutely. well now, of course, it's often connected with economic prosperity, but it was only once culture got wealthy enough that we could afford to have large segments of the population spend 10 or 12 or 15 years studying rather than working. Exactly. And you know, we just it's really easy to get confused on these issues. Look, there's a lot more to discuss about all this. And if you are interested 
uh, in getting some work, you can contact Catholic University of America, the Bush School of Business and Economics. Go to business.cua.edu. And Dr. Richard's book, Money, Greed, and God, Why Capitalism is the Solution and Not the Problem, is available at ewtnrc.com or call them 1-800-854-6316. It's a wonderful area to, to learn more and more about. Thank you very much for being with us. And we run out of time, I'm afraid. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Um, may the Lord bless all of you and keep you. Keep your faith and your economics and family in His love and integrity. And may God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, of course, you know, Mother Angelica was inspired to begin this network by having it be brought to you by you. And she always asked that we keep EWTN in between gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. We ask that you continue to do that so that we can keep on presenting these and other guests and shows to you. God bless you and thank you.